Hello, everybody. Welcome to Think Corner in Helsinki. Uh, welcome to our event, Computing and Space. You have all seen 2001 A Space Odyssey, so you all know that computers and space go well together. And this is what we will hear about today. I'm Patrick Florian from the Department of Computer Science at the University of Helsinki, and I ask now our Dean, Professor Sasu Tarkoma, to open the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. So it's really great to see you all here at Thin Corner. So we have a great program now starting, and the topic is really exciting. So computing and space research and combining those, looking at the intersection. And here we have two very high momentum areas, and of course their intersection is also very high momentum and really opening uh, new ground, new uh, vistas for us uh, to explore. And uh, also I have very good news from Finland, from uh, the Helsinki area, for research and education in these areas, so uh, both for uh, computer science and then for physics and space research, we have excellent news. We have, for example, uh, the Finnish Center for AI, so FCAI, a National Academy of Finland flagship, doing uh, excellent research on AI machine learning related topics. And then we have an Academy of Finland Center of Excellence on research in sustainable space. So two really important, uh, very fast forward moving building blocks for us. And I believe that that's just a start. So we are opening new ground. Uh, every, every day, every week, and, uh, and there are so many things that we can, we can then together uh, do, together address. And now looking at our planet, so we need to understand space systems, we need to conduct space research for the planet, and then for also understanding our universe. So there are really many directions here uh, to explore, and we need computer science, we need physics, we need other areas of science to do this. So it, it is really an excellent example of interdisciplinary collaboration. And that's, of course, a strong trend that we have at the University of Helsinki, uh, focusing on our strong areas of research and then working across these scientific areas. So that's really ground for new breakthroughs, new big science. And today we hear about certain really exciting, uh, important elements pertaining to the intersection of computing and uh, space research. We heard about space communications. So how do we use satellites for communication? And that really sets the scene for 6G. So we expect to see satellites helping us in connecting the planet. And that's really important for many things for us to communicate, also for the sustainability of the planet as well. Then we see also today and hear about how machine learning and AI plays a big role in space systems for uh, creating the satellites, for uh, creating the rovers, getting the rovers and, and these systems to the destination, for example, Mars. And then uh, we also hear that how these uh, methods are useful also for the data. We get this massive amount of data, so we need to extract the essential about you know, planetary surfaces, about atmospheres, of our own planet and other planets, and so on. So we need the methods, and our community is really uh, now working on that, and, and it's you know, really a good direction to go. And then, uh, of course, we have the data, we have the methods, then you know, the missing ingredient is the compute. We need to have supercomputers to be able to then understand what's the data and extract the insights. So today we also hear about supercomputers, how they play a big role in space research and what are the latest trends there. That's also a very important area. So four great keynote talks are about to start and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here and open the event. And also it's my great pleasure to introduce the first keynote speaker. So we have today here uh, Professor Emeritus Ayan Akildis, who did a very long and uh, fruitful groundbreaking career at Georgia Tech in the US. He has pioneered, pioneered many areas of science, uh, especially starting from telecommunications, but then expanding also to other directions. So he has worked on underwater communication, on bio nanosystems, on uh, 
basic networking technology, and then expanding to space communications. So many different areas of, of science being covered and, and telecommunications and many groundbreaking uh, results are there. And today we hear his keynote on space communications, a field in which he has many pioneering results as well. So uh, I have so many good things to tell about Ayan, so about the awards and about the centers he has established worldwide. But now, since the list is so long, let's give the floor to Ayan. Welcome. Thanks a lot, uh, Sasu, and thanks for coming and listening to me. Uh, I would like to start to say uh, that I have, or I had 40 years career, and I worked 35 years for Georgia Tech, and I did a lot of research on space communications for NASA, especially 95 through 2005, and I had many contributions. And then, as you may remember, 2004, there was an accident and NASA had some problems with funding, and then I got out. And then I came back in 2016 after seeing the CubeSats technology, and I got excited again, and I started to conduct research on that, and today I will talk about uh, CubeSats and also the uh, interesting challenges, especially within the 6G systems. And uh, so this is a... Uh, uh, overview about uh, 6G technologies that uh, we mentioned this in the paper that we put together a couple of years ago. And I cannot go through all of this because I have only 20 minutes time. So as you see in the, in the core Internet of Space things, satellites, all types of geos and meos and uh, leos and also CubeSats, plus the drones, for example. And uh, so uh, we'll talk about that part. And then there are some other ones like very high frequency bands, terahertz band, for example, which I will also uh, mention in my talk because it plays a, a big role. And, and then, of course, authorization. And here's another picture about uh, networking 2030. And this is from the ITU. If you saw the ITU, I have an affiliation with the International Telecommunication Union. And they, are, they have this networking 2030 uh, group, and they are also uh, writing a bunch of reports. And I improvised it you know, based on my taste also. And you see uh, the target is networking 2030, and uh, satellites and CubeSats and drones play a major role here also. And, uh, oh, I should use this one, right? So everybody talks about Internet of Things, right? And uh, this will be also next generation of Internet of Things, like uh, we call them uh, like Internet of Space Things, again with all these additional components coming out with uh, uh, CubeSats and drones and of course LEOs. And there will be like uh, uh, many, many like billions of devices and they will be covering the space uh, segment in addition to the ground segment of these Internet of Things. And uh, so uh, uh, how I got into this uh, CubeSats technology, as I explained to you, that I got excited in 2016. I was invited by University of New Mexico for a, a seminar, and there is a uh, Air Force Research Lab there. And I, I knew about CubeSats, but then after I saw the technology, how advanced they were, and I got interested, and I came back, and I said, how can I find an angle to get into the uh, research of the uh, CubeSats and also these space things? And uh, after so you know, many months brainstorming and working with my uh, PhD students, uh, so we uh, uh, wrote these articles that time, and I will explain to you also the angles that we came in. We also got uh, uh, many uh, patterns, I will point them out to you. So this is kind of like this grid or the space segment with all these new uh, components that uh, we will talk about. And uh, so a brief uh, introduction about satellite technology, very quick. So there are these three different uh, satellite uh, 
constellations like geostation or geosynchronous satellites, like most of the TV uh, uh, programs are using. They are like 22,000 miles or 36,000 kilometers uh, in the, at the level of the equator, and then they are hovering with the Earth. And then the uh, medium Earth orbit satellites and low Earth orbit satellites. For example, you can have three geosatellites to cover the entire Earth and uh, like 10 medium Earth orbit satellites and then multiple, many of the low Earth orbit satellites, for example, Iridium 66 and, you know, Global Star and all these, you know, in those ranges, tens of uh, uh, satellites. So you can see here these numbers here. And there are also these Van Allen belt, belts, uh, outer and inner Van Allen belts, and you cannot put uh, any satellites in those areas because of the radiation problems. Okay, so uh, now this technology that I'm talking about under the name of cubes, CubeSats, it's more than just CubeSats. And they are known under the name small satellites. So like uh, uh, there are so-called mini satellites, like 100 to 180 kilogram, microsatellites, nanosatellites, which are the CubeSats, uh, like one to 10 kilograms, Pico satellites, and FEMTA satellites. So we are focusing on the uh, uh, CubeSats, as I explained to you. And so, so now why do we need small satellites, right? We have all these uh, satellites already out there. First of all, the conventional satellites that they're already existing have very high costs, longer development cycles, and very high entry bar. Okay, it's, it's very costly technology. And, uh, and also long duration for the typical development and deployment takes approximately seven years. And also the uh, construction and launching costs are enormous. And also high risk exposure. And uh, for example, the 2016 Hitomi telescope failure led to loss of $300 million and 10 years of research. So if you have problems, then a lot of money and uh, time is wasted for these uh, uh, conventional satellites. And they're also not flexible. Okay? So what is the background of the CubeSat? So when you, uh, you know, look into this technology, especially in the United States, these uh, novel technologies are coming from the top 10 schools in general, right? So this idea came from California State University, uh, a Catalan, Jordi Puig Suari, and, but he was with NASA before. And then also Bob Twiggs, uh, he was just uh, kind of like the uh, uh, anyhow, uh, backup. And in 1999, and I remember we were talking about it in, uh, in, with NASA people while I was working, and so we didn't take them seriously. And uh, so they used this uh, one U as the unit. So one U meaning 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Three U means 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters. Or 10 U is 100, uh, I'm sorry, 10 meters, um, yeah, t uh, 100 centimeters, 100 centimeters, and 100 centimeters, okay? There are many advantages of CubeSats. They are scalable, flexible, adaptive, and they can be easily integrated to the other existing satellite technologies as well as with drones and uh, low cost and built with commercial off-the-shelf components. In fact, you see here as an example, if you have a little bit of knowledge in hardware, you can do your own uh, CubeSat or you know, design your own CubeSat. And it's very short development and deployment phase. These are the advantages of the uh, small satellites or CubeSats. Okay. So now here are the, you know, again, I don't have too much time, the internal organs of the CubeSats of course, we have electrical power systems, command and data handling, attitude, determination and control, payloads, and this is the communication systems like the transceiver side on, on the right hand side. So, and also the uh, uh, industry is not sleeping. I have some examples here. So now all these companies around the world from Switzerland, Australia, Canada, Spain, USA, there are many, many uh, CubeSat uh, companies are existing. And even uh, uh, Elon Musk has this uh, Rintintin or whatever it's called from his SpaceX company. So they are, uh, they are really primitive CubeSats, right? 
So now their orbital altitudes are like around 500 to 800 kilometers, a little bit lower than the LEO satellites. And the number of satellites vary. Okay, I will also point them out because after I went through all these existing technologies, I want to find these open angles as I explained to you. So that's why I'm just pointing them out to you, but then I will repeat what were the open issues that where we came in. And then most of them are using fixed frequency bands like L band or KAKU bands, and uh, or also their sizes are between 3U, 12U, etc. So. So this is the big overview about existing technologies, and also mostly they're applying these typical IoT and machine-to-machine -machine communications. And the biggest problem, again, I will come back more, uh, is uh, the number of these satellites is low. So they always come to, let's say, on top of the Finland, and then they can collect information, and then they move out, and then they can come back, right? So there is no always all the time coverage problems, or coverage solutions, in other words. That's what we found out. There are more cases. So that's the uh, slide I want to present to you. In fact, if you have young people that the research always try to find these uh, open angles when you come into an area, right? So first of all, uh, as I explained to you, lack of continuous global coverage. Okay, so with all these existing CubeSats, that's the problem. So you have to wait until they come back uh, to cover Finland, for example. Another uh, biggest problem was they're all low data rates. So now we are talking about like uh, gigabit, terabit per second on the terrestrial networks. And when you go up there, like kilobit per second, megabit per second, they're really low. And then uh, they also use fixed uh, frequency band. Like as I said, L band or KU band or KA band. There is no flexibility in terms of uh, frequency bands. And uh, I didn't mention this. One of the research topics for the 6G is using reconfigurable front-end design hardware, which will be dynamically adapt, adapt to any frequency bands, not like compartmentize you know, 2.4 or 5 or, or whatever, 60 gigahertz. So everything will be dynamic, reconfigurable. So, uh, uh, so this is, uh, the, the, those were the points that we tried to attack. And then, uh, so we came up with this, uh, you know, uh, uh, these solutions. So the space segment, first of all, we came up with the new CubeSat architecture with the hardware ideas. I will explain them to you. And in this architecture, we have so-called reconfigurable, dynamic, adaptive, multi-frequency band front ends, okay? And then also, in the uh, space, they communicate in the terahertz band. Uh, I did a lot of research on terahertz band on the terrestrial uh, segment and uh, since 15 years. So we always found out that the distance is the biggest problem in the terahertz band communication, very high frequency band. So when you go beyond one meter, the path loss or the signal gets so f uh, affected, you cannot have a meaningful uh, uh, communication because of the, all the atmospheric effects, especially the water particles are the biggest enemy. So we, are, we have been working on it since uh, 15 years to solve that problem, distance problem. And now in the space, we don't have any atmospheric effects. So we, I said, why don't we use terahertz up in the, in the uh, space segment and, but then, going up and down, right, uplink and downlink, we cannot go on the terahertz band because of the atmospheric effects. And then we said, okay, we'll have any uh, frequency bands from one gigahertz up to two or three terahertz, again, available to us. And then this hardware will be reconfigurable, meaning depending on the channel conditions, the front end can decide which frequency band to use to communicate. And the same thing, the CubeSats must have that capability too, so that they can communicate with the uh, 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 equipment or devices uh, on the ground. I hope you get the point here. And then another thing that is new is uh, that uh, 
again, 5G is totally based on SDN and NF NFV technology. If you don't know it, don't worry about it. So it's all softwareization, right? So like 5G is the ma major part of the 5G is based on SDN and NFV technology. And same thing it will happen in 6G, by the way. It will continue. So now, one of the problems of the old uh, classical satellite technology was that uh, everything, all the software was uh, co implemented on the, on the satellites. So why don't we do this? So the same thing as 10 NFE technology on the ground. The controllers will be on the ground. All the software and the protocols will be running on the ground, right? And then these devices are just like the uh, typical P4 switches, or uh, again, if it's technical, sorry about it. So like dumb switches, they will just forward the, uh, the, the uh, uh, data to the uh, uh, you know, destination. So everything will be controlled from the ground. And also, it will be easy to integrate the terrestrial networks with the non-terrestrial, meaning satellite networks. Plus, you can also integrate them with uh, LEOs and MEOs and GEOs, right? I hope you are getting the point. So uh, these are the, uh, some of the papers. Yeah, I know, unfortunately. And uh, so we have, uh, and also the overview of the project that we uh, uh, had like three years uh, working on that. So we had the CubeSat design, like the transceiver, and also we used massive and ultra-massive MIMO communications, like very large number of antennas, and, uh, and also some global resource allocation techniques. Also for the STN and FE part, we had all the uh, you know, new uh, algorithms for dynamic and scalable scalable network configuration, and satellite infrastructure as a service, and generic solution for ubiquitous connectivity. So we have a suite of the uh, patterns, and today I received another mail from the lawyer. They will like, apply for more, so I hope someday it will bring more money, but it will go to Georgia Tech. Uh, so this is the design, that our design is, I, I have to be rushing, so 10 by, uh, 10 by 34 uh, centimeters. These are the flapped antennas. So when they're launched, they open up. And then, you know, all these uh, solar cells on them. And the novel thing is also, I hope I can show you uh, here. OK. Here is the multi-band antenna array with our, again, another pattern for multi-band antenna arrays. And uh, all of these nice features. And uh, now also you can see that uh, we can uh, you know, have both uh, uh, electromagnetic communications as well as photonic communications. It's everything dynamic, right? That's what our, we are talking about. And algorithms, uh, routing, etc. cetera. So, uh, so again, these are some of the uh, design issues. Again, more. You can see any of these bands can be utilized as needed. So now not fixed frequency band, but uh, uh, dynamic. And, uh, and then also here some more information about the antenna design. Uh, there are, again, uh, you know, fabrication issues, uh, open problem that we need to fabricate them. And uh, so, yeah, there's, there are many, <laughs> sorry about it. So many, many research issues still, you know, and uh, uh, then also we have this STN and FE based CubeSat communications. This already is used for the 5G, 6G systems or will be used for 6G and same concept will be used to support the space segment. And, uh, and then another question was in our uh, case, that's the architecture for the STN and FE based. Everything's controlled from the uh, ground. And uh, now the other question was, how many satellites or CubeSats do we need anytime, anywhere uh, coverage of the Earth? So that's the research we did, like large-scale constellation design. We also got patent for it and published that. So we, have, uh, we found some certain number of CubeSats that uh, you can uh, you know, deploy and cover the Earth all the time. I think I should stop here. And uh, I have two minutes, I assume. And if you have questions, thank you. I'm really rushing. I'm sorry. I had, you know, like 65, you know, it's like one hour keynote, but I rushed it in 20 minutes. 
So I hope you got the point. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. You told me that people are shy. They don't ask questions. Yeah. It's good that... Uh, You were talking about uh, gigahertz, terahertz networks. What do you see or envision the role of optical data link or laser data link in uh, these future yes, constellations? Because, yeah, because also I had, uh, maybe I was too fast. I said we are supporting also photonic communication, right? It's dynamic. It can go uh, dual mode between electromagnetic and optical. We support that too, yes. Actually, this is the future, like multi-mode. I mentioned this to you. Multi-mode design of all the devices is the future. And in fact, NASA had, I'm sorry, not NASA always, DARPA, that's the Department of Defense, had this idea since a long time. And now some results are coming out, reconfigurable front ends, like going that direction. Like Sasha mentioned that uh, I work underwater for uh, Abu Dhabi. So we have a patent application now for multi-mode underwater equipment with magnetic induction, acoustic communication, and also optical communication. So that's the way to go really in the future. And the same thing, the future is no more strict frequency band. Like, you know, in the football soccer, right? You say, I just play in this position that was in the 60s. Now everybody plays anywhere, right? So that's a similar thing now. No more strict uh, compartmentizing of the technologies. Thanks for the question. Any further, qu any further question? Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the very nice presentation. So I have another question about the dynamic system. So nowadays we are really want to apply AI and machine learning methods into like this field. So do you have any idea of whether we can use like data-driven method for this dynamic? Oh because yeah, because I, I okay, you know we had time limitations and constraints. Of course, AI machine learning. Uh, it will be mentioned, uh, it's, it will be a big part, but I didn't talk about software part, right? Like for, the, for example, resource allocations, routing algorithms, etc. It will be heavily based on AI and machine learning, okay? So absolutely, but you know, there's no time to talk about those. But let, since you mentioned it, let me share you my uh, opinion. I hope I'm not taking too much time. So, uh, you know, I, I have almost 40, 40 plus years now, wow. I was, <laughs> anyhow, so now what happens is somebody starts something saying, let's go with AI machine learning, and uh, now everybody, woo, and we all use these, you know, all types of neural network, you know, all the states, right? Like I always, I used to teach that, uh, so you put, you know, when you know about how to make sausage, right? You put a lot of things here, and some sausage comes out, Sometimes you don't know is it true or not, and you say, let's try again and try again. So it's a heuristic technology, you know, because you put a lot of probabilities there. And you can say, I have t trillions of the data. Still, I would not have uh, life-threatening or, you know, life missions uh, for the current technology. So what happens is all the young people, when I ask them, what do you do, AI machine learning, but they're always following what other people do. So why not, you know, but it it's a risk, right? So why not, can we re-mimic, everybody talks about digital twins, right? So in fact, I was, you know, I'm, I have been working also on health applications with bio nanoscale machines. Can we create artificial brains, right? And create neurons, how they work? It's a different path, but it's a risk. It will take maybe three, five years, 10 years. But what we do is we say, OK, I change a little bit here, this machine learning technique. We have uh, GANs and you know, deep learning techniques. But that's all around you know, circling. So I will encourage people, just think about out of box, you know, something different. It's definitely true how we can create human-like machines. But I will not go with that path. That's what I say. 
I'm sure some people will hate me, but there they are. So, okay. Thanks. I, I actually have one question. I was looking at, at, at your slides about the multitude of uh, very small satellites. You had the nanosatellites you were talking about, the PICO satellites, FEMTO satellites. So there will be lots of garbage in the sky. I mean, it will be filled up. Is this feasible? We will have a problem in the future that uh, okay, so uh, things are not going to work because there's too much uh, out there. And if, uh, you know, if things are going in high speed, so a, a small screw colliding with something, and pff, it's rubbish. Okay, this is a good question. In fact, this is a big problem that the United Nations are debating since many, many decades. I'm serious. There is, uh, it's uh, the space like a trash. Many countries, even underdeveloped countries, they have their own satellites and they are dysfunctional, but nobody takes the uh, responsibility and uh, cleans them. So we already have a lot of garbage out there, and I hope, we, but then, you know, the, the also to uh, uh, clean them, is not, it's very costly, right? Because they are very uh, uh, heavy uh, uh, equipment. But with these cube sets, you know, they're very small, right? So when, you know, you can go and collect them. It's easier to collect the small garbage than the big garbage. So that will also help us. So it will not be like billions of these CubeSats around and none of them are functional or many of them. That will not be the case. So it will also help that part. Okay. Yeah, on the other hand, my understanding is that for big satellites, the kind of trend, as far as I know, is to also have some kind of mechanism for them to like deviate from the orbit so that they will fall down and, and, and burn in the atmosphere or something like that, exactly. so that they, in a way, self-clean at the exactly. end, of, end of life. That's right. Good yeah. point. And also easier to clean. I mean, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we thank once more Ian for thank the talk. You. And we go over to the next speaker, who is Professor Laura Ruotsalainen. She's, uh, she, her uh, theme is, is uh, spatiotemporal data analysis for sustain sustainability science. So quite a difficult uh, uh, thing to say. Uh, anyways, uh, she is also very much involved in uh, uh, the leadership of uh, the Finnish Center for Artificial Intelligence that Sasu was mentioning. He, she's part of the steering group there and, and uh, leads an area called AI for Sustainability. And she's also affiliated with uh, the Helsinki Institute for, of, of Sustainability Science, HELSUS. And I'm really intrigued to see if she's really now going to Mars, because the, the, the title for Laura's talk is uh, AI will help people go anywhere on Earth and even to Mars. So maybe we have a future astronaut here? Maybe we find out. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Patrick, and, and good evening, everyone. And no, I'm, I'm not personally planning to go Mars, but definitely what we will develop will then help the other people to go safely there. So, so, so let's get into that, but not personally. But, but so I am going to talk about the research that we do uh, on AI, so, so in detail. So we are doing machine learning research, so deep learning, so these neural networks that we are just kind of like mentioned previously. And I'm going to talk about two different themes that, that we develop the, the deep learning methods for. And the other part is, is how can we use uh, space-based measurements to help people to go on Earth everywhere they want to go. So kind of like in practice to know where they are and navigate to the, the places they want to go. And, and then also I will then talk about the other team, uh, so how we are working uh, with, together with NASA to help them to get their goals to get people to Mars. But okay, so, so as, as promised, so I, I will be talking about uh, measurements coming from space, so talking about satellite navigation. So how can we use the satellite navigation measurements uh, to get the accurate position and navigation information on Earth? So, so I guess everyone has been using GPS for, for navigating uh, and, and noticed that it provides really good uh, kind of like accuracy. So we can know five to 10 meter accuracy where we are and, and that's very global. So we know that everywhere on the earth. 
And it has been noticed to be so good uh, method to, to navigate people on Earth that uh, many countries or areas have also started developing their own uh, navigation satellite systems. And therefore, even that in kind of like normal communication, people talk about GPS in, in research and we talk about GNSS, so global navigation satellite systems. So, so Russia has their own CLONASS system, uh, China has a Beidou system, and Europe has our own, own Galileo system that all work interoperable. And it's so good and flexible and seamless that people don't really even notice that you all are using most likely all the four systems when you are navigating. And that's also why the, the accuracy is, is so good. In addition to getting now the, the really good position information on Earth and finding the places, GNSS is also a very uh, important part of critical infrastructure. So the time solution that we get from the, the signals that come uh, from the space, we are able to compute very, very accurate, precise time information that is used, for example, for synchronizing energy uh, transmission, uh, internet, uh, uh, the banking systems and everything. So it's very uh, critical in many activities. And also, if you look at the picture here and think about the future, so how we think that the future will look, the sustainable future, it will be based on having many autonomous vehicles, for example, because of their very important sustainability uh, kind of like benefits for, for the society. And now if we are talking about getting somewhere accurately uh, with five to 10 meters, uh, kind of like precision, then when we are talking about autonomous systems, autonom autonomous vehicles, we, we are not fine with only five to 10 meters. So we want to have something very accurate and also something very reliable. So we want to know that when we are getting the position information, we can't tolerate that something is interrupting uh, the, the positioning and navigation. Okay, so, so as was shown on the previous uh, uh, presentation, uh, so, so the uh, satellites uh, are kind of like on, on the space, they are on three different uh, kind of like orbits, uh, orbits, and then the GNSS, the navigation satellites, they are at the MEO orbit, so meaning that they are 20,000 kilometers away from Earth. And then, of course, when the, the signals propagate through the kind of like the, the space, they get quite weak when, when they come to the Earth. And they are very vulnerable for all kind of like interference. So, so there is many kinds of kind of like natural interference. So, so we have so-called ionospheric interference that comes from space. And, and then when the signals come to the uh, ground level, they are then bouncing from constructions. And, and then we talk about multipath. And they all do some harm for the signal. But what is really kind of like alarming and, and sad is that, of course, when we have something that is a kind of like basis of something very critical, our critical infrastructure, there is also intentional interference done by humans. And then the two kind of like first types of interference that I have on the list, the jamming and spoofing, are something that humans are purposely doing in the intention of either harming the system or then by, by the fact that they don't really know what they are doing. So the jamming means that someone is transmitting signals that are at the same frequency bands as, as these GNSS signals. And, and then when, when kind of like the signal comes to the receiver that is, is trying to compute the position and, and timing, so then the uh, harmful the jamming signal gets over the actual navigation signal and we are not able to get the navigation information from the uh, real signal there. So it's burying or all the kind of like the correct signals under it. And as I said, so jamming is it kind of like needs a, a transmitter. Someone has an equipment that they use and then transmit this uh, kind of like wrong signal that is then taking over the, the, the GNSS positioning. And as I said, so, so people can do that kind of like purposely, but quite a lot is done by kind of like not knowingly. So people are trying to protect their own receivers. So for example, uh, truck drivers don't want their employers to the track where they are going and when they are having breaks and they use these jammers in order to try to kind of like bury their own uh, GNSS signal and, and so that the employer is not able to track them. Uh, 
but they don't know that the signals don't just say, stay inside their cars, but they propagate all around in the environment. They can go even kilometers away from, from the jamming device. And, and then that's, of course, harmful for all the systems that are in the, the area. And then also the other type of intentional interference is called spoofing. And then that means that someone is de deliberately sending signal that is kind of like the correct GNSS signal, but, but it's kind of like has some kind of differences so that the receiver that gets it thinks that it is in different position than where it actually is. And, and that is, of course, very harmful. So, so that's kind of like you have probably seen in media some events that have been reported that, for example, uh, vessels have been tried to be hijacked by, by kind of like sending them wrong position information so that people have thought that they are in, in different place than where they actually are. That is fortunately so difficult to be done, the spoofing, that, that it's not yet that kind of like much done in, in the uh, kind of like in, in the society yet, but of course, very, very harmful if done. Okay, so, so now it comes to the, the fact that, of course, we have to protect the GNSS. As I said, it's it's very critical part of, of the infrastructure, and then we, we need to protect it somehow. So the first phase is, of course, that we have to know that there is uh, jamming or spoofing uh, going on. So we have to detect that something is happening for our system. And then uh, we, we need to localize where is the transmitter? How are we able to stop this harmful act? So we have to localize the jamming or spoofing devices. And then, of course, we have to way, uh, find ways that, to kind of like prevent that happening. We have to find some ways of, of then kind of like stopping uh, the, the harmful act, acts. And then we have to get some ways to mitigate the effects. So we want to then kind of like sustain getting the, the very valuable, imp important information. And then this is one kind of like example also how, how kind of like sadly uh, kind of like uh, much the jamming is done. There is one, one example of, of uh, one of the detectors that we have in a very northern part of Finland. So in a very uh, kind of like distant road that there isn't even that much of, of traffic, and still we are detecting these jamming events there almost daily. So, so it means that it is actually really much happening all the time in the society. So we really have to do something for that. Okay, and, and as I said, so, uh, uh, and yeah, and, and something that I, I also must at this point say that of course that, that the, the jamming is illegal. So, so it is illegal almost everywhere in the world. And then therefore, of course, it is very important to be stopped. And then that is also making the, the research a bit kind of like challenging because uh, when it's illegal to use the jamming devices, then where do we get the data? And then for that we have, uh, the, the first option is of course that we use simulated data. And then here are some examples uh, of the uh, deep learning methods that we have been developing. So how are we able very early in, in the phase of, of kind of like uh, seeing the, the, some interferences in the signal, how are we able to detect and make an alarm? So, so say that now something is disturbing the system, so we have to take some other means to, to protect that we get the valuable information. And then therefore we have been uh, developing something called anomaly, anomaly detectors. So we have, we have developed these uh, neural networks, deep learning based uh, so-called autoencoders that are able to learn from the real signal. So how should the signal look in reality? So then they are able immediately, when we get the signal to the receiver, they are able to say that now there is something wrong with the signal, we have to take some other means to use. And one important part of the research is to find so-called statistical uh, threshold there. So when do we know that something, something is now harming our receiver? And then the examples that you see here, so there are the first ones are some different, kind of like very different kinds of jamming events. And, and then uh, the, the brown one in the middle is the one that is now the actual clean signal. So it is very clearly almost all the measurements are below the threshold. But what are then these kind of like, the, and, and then there is the spoofing is on, on the right, and, and then there are 
kind of like few uh, examples that still go below the threshold, even that they are jamming. And then those are still something, for example, that there are many different jamming devices detected at the same time. And so then they are still disturbing the signal so badly that we are not able to detect. And also the multipath that comes from, from the ground when the signals are bouncing are still something that we have to kind of like tune the, the, the methods uh, forward so that they are able to detect those two. And, and of course, in, in when we are doing the research, so, so it's, it's a bit different than when you have the real receiver. So when kind of like the signal gets already into the receiver, there are some detection methods that, get, that can detect that there is something wrong at that stage. But the problem is, of course, that when the, the signal or the, the jamming signal, when the interference is so strong that it's burying the signal completely, then these older or kind of like more traditional methods for detecting then the interference, they don't work anymore because you are not able to compute any measurements out from the signal. So that's meaning that we have to do that already from the raw signal at the first phase when we get hold on it. Okay, but as I said, so, so that was what we were doing with simulated signals, but, but the uh, jamming signals look very different when they are simulated or when they are in, in the real world, so also kind of like having the real GNSS signals mixed with them. And, and so we have been working, uh, funded by European Space Agency with Norwegian colleague, colleagues, uh, developing a, a monitoring kind of like network that has been then put uh, in many places in Europe and also like three detectors in, in the northern part of Finland. And then there were a few purposes for doing this and I would say that the main purpose was that we wanted to kind of like develop low-cost uh, equipment, low-cost methods for the authorities to be able to monitor whole uh, kind of like or, or countries or large areas with cheap devices and be able then to monitor the situation. And then so we, we were able to do that. So we developed uh, something called ARFIDA, so our Advanced RFI Detection Analysis and Alerting Systems that were then put uh, in, in different places. And as I said, now, now this was a low-cost uh, system, kind of like detecting if there is some jamming, some interference, intentional interference, uh, kind of like present, and, and then there was a reporting system. So, so reporting solution, whenever it detected that there is something harmful happening, it kind of like took part of, of the data and, and submitted that into cloud-based database. And then the other important point for doing this was, of course, also now to be able to gather this real-life jamming data, because as I said, we are not even allowed for, for research purposes to, to make that because it's illegal, we can't do the jamming. So therefore it was really important now to gather all the real jamming events and then be able to use those also for research. And the great thing with this research was that also the data is open for all the kind of like research entities that want to use it for their research purposes. Okay, as I said, so, so it's not enough to know that something is wrong. We also have to know where this kind of like harm comes from so that we are able to stop it. So therefore, we must be able then to localize where the jamming or, or spoofing is coming from. And at the moment, this is some, some kind of like one really emerging research plan. So, so there is quite little research already done for doing this jamming localization. And probably one of the reasons is, again, the same thing, that there isn't really so many possibilities of doing the research because we are not able to, to do the jamming purposely on kind of like real world. So saying that, of course, in, in that case, we need to use then simulators. And we have really fancy simulator at the Department of Computer Science that we are able to use for, for then creating the jamming signals and then the real GNSS signals. But unfortunately, it has one problem that it doesn't really provide us as the means of tracking the jamming signal. And not any of the very fancy simulators seem to provide that. So therefore, we had to build it ourselves. And then we started building one, and now we have been able to build by joining the fancy GNSS simulator and MATLAB ray tracing methods together. And now we have a simulator that does provide us the, the information, how the kind of like interference signals propagate, and we are able to use that for our localization research. 
And as I said, so, so now we have been then developing uh, novel machine learning methods, because also the tra more traditional machine learning methods don't really provide us accurate information. So, so there isn't really methods that, yet, that would provide us really accurate information about the localization of these devices. And then therefore, we are now then developing those based on, on the deep learning and our new simulator. Okay, so as I said, so now we are at the phase that we know that there is something wrong, we find where, where this wrong is coming, but then we have to be able to prove that the, the signal is really coming from this certain device that is doing the jamming, for example. And, and, and uh, fortunately, all these equipment that are used for creating this jamming device, they leave certain fingerprint for the signal. And then this is something that we are now developing the, the deep learning methods to be able to find from the signal the, the fingerprints and be able to say that it is for sure that this jamming came from this certain jammer. And, and again, the challenge here is the lack of data. So we have uh, purchased, we have a permission to, to kind of like do this in very kind of like constrained uh, situations. We have an anechoic chamber at the department. So we are able to, to use a certain number of these chambers there in the place where we know definitely that the signal is not kind of like going out. But, but then again, the problem is that, that it's kind of like we can buy just a small number of, of the devices. And then, of course, there's a, we have to be sure that when we say that this is the, the certain equipment that did the jamming, so there can't be any, un or there has to be very little uncertainty in our statement. And therefore, we are now developing Bayesian deep learning methods to be able then to say that, that we know what are the fingerprints and then we know that the, the jamming came from this certain uh, equipment or device. Okay, so, so now we, we are at the phase that we know where, where, that there is something wrong with the signal, but of course we want then to have the system still running. So I said it's part of critical infrastructure, so we have to know, or we have, must have ways of mitigating the effect. So kind of like the, the usually used methods are some signal processing, so we can try to improve the GNSS signal, but as I said, if the jamming or, or spooking is really strong, then that doesn't really help anymore. Uh, some countries are building these uh, terrestrial uh, navigation systems that can be then used as replacement of GNSS. But our research is now also addressing the fact that there are many kind of like consumer devices that, that also have, for example, cameras, inertial sensors inside. And when we do sensor fusion, we fuse the GNSS signal with the camera information, uh, uh, sensor information, we are able to, to maintain uh, the, the time and position information for longer time. Okay, then still a few words about now going to Mars or jumping to totally different topic. So I said, so, so uh, NASA ha has hopes to, to send people to Mars in, in the coming decade or so. And, and of course, it, it is very critical uh, to, to kind of like know that if something goes wrong in, in the, the space shuttle. So, so uh, Mars is really far away, so it takes six months to go there. And, and then there will be only four crew members in the space shuttle. So if something goes wrong, we have to know really in early advance that something is, is happening, and then we have to be able to detect what is wrong, and, and then that the crew can, can then take some, some predictive uh, kind of like measures. And then what we are doing is that we are de uh, uh, developing uh, failure prediction methods based on AI and also the anomaly detection to, to understand that there's something wrong with the signal. And the situation is really challenging also from the viewpoint that the shuttles, they have 300,000 sensors, so huge amount of sensors, so anything can go wrong. So the, the sensors have really high sampling rates, so we have a huge amount of data coming all the time. And, and then they kind of like the computers that are doing the computation of, uh, on board, they are very low grade. And then also we have the challenge that usually the maintenance is done from ground, but there is also 20 to 40 minutes delay from the information coming from the shuttle to, to ground. And then of course this means that we have to be really kind of like predictive, we have to be early to, to notice that something is wrong. And as I said, so we are now developing the, the uh, uh, machine learning methods to be able to do the detection there. 
And then, again, another challenge uh, for this is that there is no data available because that kind of like the spacecrafts, they are not even built yet. So, so the NASA doesn't even know what kind of systems they will then eventually put into the uh, crafts. So therefore, there is no data yet available. But of course, when we are developing deep learning based or machine learning based methods, we do need the data. So the first uh, kind of like activity was to find a good collaborator who is able then to provide us data that is as close as possible uh, to, to be used in the project. And we were really happy to be able to kind of like collaborate with Wärtsilä, who has power plants that they are kind of like controlling. And then they don't have the 300,000 sensors, but they have 300 sensors in seven inches. So we do have get the data from thousands of, of kind of like sensors at the same time. So there we are now, now doing development and, and, and developing the methods. And as I said, so, so the uh, research is funded by the Ministry of Education, but we are working together in very close collaboration with NASA, who is kind of like setting then the goals to the projects and giving us advice there then to, to get the people to go mass, but not myself. Okay, but that was all from me, thank you. Do, do you have any questions? <laughs> and, and do we have time? Yeah, yeah, we do have, yeah, exactly the five minutes. Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, my question is actually on the short point you mentioned at the very beginning, so I hope you're okay with having questions about that, but that got me curious. You said that automated vehicles were a like, crucial part of sustainability. Yes. And can you uh, expand on that? Oh, slightly, definitely, if, yeah. If you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, so from many viewpoints, so, so as we think about sustainability, so always we must think about the social, economic and, and ecological sustainability. So, so thinking that when we have autonomous vehicles, so they have all the sensors that do all the kind of like perception of the environment, meaning that they, they kind of like concentrate. Uh, okay, I don't know how much time I will have, but, but let's uh, try, I'll try to be fast. So at the moment, there are 1.3 million people dying yearly because of uh, traffic accidents. And, and that is mainly due to people well, using smartphones while they are driving. And of course, when we have vehicles that have sensors, cameras that are doing all the perception, it means that they are all the time concentrating. So we can kind of like save lives by that. Then the other point is, is also that kind of like when we are able to organize the traffic in the way that, for example, the, uh, the, the vehicles are synchronized so, so that they don't have to accelerate and brake or they don't have to wait in traffic lights. So the, thereby we also get reduction of the CO2 emissions. So, so these are the, the two that I can kind of like quickly now think about. Hi, Tero Vihavainen from Ministry of Economics. Uh, I'm not going to ask about CNSS because we have... A, I know, you know, yeah. <laughs> we have already discussed. But uh, the last sentence you saw on the slides was that um, you are collecting data from motors. And uh, luckily, Wärtsilä motors are very reliable and... Uh, I suppose you get a, a lot of data of normal operating time, but uh, failures are quite rare. Maybe if those are good motors, it's once in a year. So yeah. how you are going to get enough data of failures? Well, I actually, I think we do have quite a lot. So, so we have uh, data for for very long time, and then also we have really good collaboration in the way that Wärtsilä people they are kind of like marking down into they are kind of like labeling to us when there are some failures. So we are not kind of like considering only the failures when the whole kind of like power plant crashes, but of course everything small that there happens, some some sensors fail, and then of course they, it they don't cause that the whole system will fail, but there are some failures and then they are replaced, but we can detect that already from this kind of like the measurements. Yeah, if that replied to your question. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Uh, 
Uh, in the direction finding array that you have, are the individual sensors direction finders themselves, or is it like an omnidirectional receiver and they are processed together to get the kind of direction where the jammer is? Uh, no, we are using just kind of like normal uh, antennas, if that was your question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because this has rather long-running history with the direction finding and these kind of arrays, and there's definitely been these military applications, and I imagine part of the like lack of data is likely that that data is classified itself. Uh, you mean for the localization research? Localization research and this kind of jamming. There's definitely, for example, the US has the rivet joint and these kind of very advanced platforms that but, have like a very long development history in this regard. Yeah, might be, yeah. But also kind of like our goal is, is to develop these in, in more kind of like low-cost systems. I, I, I know that, for example, kind of like really advanced systems can do this already, but, but our goal is, is to do that so that all the receivers could be doing it, yeah. So not needing kind of like specific equipment. equipment. Yeah. Okay, uh, I was thinking that uh, uh, when you talked about spoofing, so this is the thing that has been in the news many times about that they uh, uh, assume that the Russians have been doing something across the board, uh, border and the f f flights have not the correct like uh, information. So this is exactly what, what those news items are about. Yeah, but I, I think the news were mainly about jamming. So, so oh, meaning yeah. that, yeah, kind of so like, the, yeah, spoofing. no, no, the receivers just didn't kind of like know where they are. And of course, kind of like the big uh, airports, they don't rely on GNSS only. So they have kind of like terrace or land systems there. But the small airports, they rely on using GNSS only. And that was the fact why they couldn't kind of like land on, on the smaller airports. And then that was the problem. Okay, and you have your connections to NASA, so if anybody wants to go to Mars, should they contact you or, or what should they do? Um, well, I, I don't think that we, I have connections to the right people, so maybe they should look for some space programs where they are recruiting people. Okay, so thanks uh, again to Laura for this talk. Thank you. So Laura was from the Department of Computer Science. Now we stay in the faculty, but, but go to another department. Our next speakers are from uh, uh, the Department of Geosciences and Geography. Uh, we have uh, Tomasz Kohut, you can come up already on stage, who is a university researcher, a docent, uh, working on planetary geolo geology and geophysics, and his postdoc, uh, David Korda. So you will talk about uh, composition of planetary surfaces using machine learning tools. So, and you have some demonstration material with you. That's nice. Thanks. OK, so the floor is yours. OK, so we would like to tell you how we actually use machine learning as a tool to get some information into composition of planetary surfaces like asteroid on moon, and how we use it to extract actually new information from a um, old legacy data sets. So I am Tomáš Kohout, and this is David Korda. Yeah, hello. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, neural networks are mathematical models that tries to mimic functionality of human brain. It receives some inputs, processes it in a layer of neurons, and gives you some outputs based on the uh, on the own experience of the of the network. So it's actually important to realize that this is not a preset process, but the whole learning is a continuous, ongoing activity, like in our brain when we get new information. Training of the network is a process of self-learning or self-teaching. It's usually done with a large data sets of data for which we know the results. It might be, for example, a data set of pictures of dogs and cats, and for every picture, we know if it is a dog or a cat. We provide uh, the network the information about the results, but the network must find its own way how to derive uh, the results from the, from the picture. Yes, that's right. 
So basically, we don't say that cat has sharp ears and do dog has uh, rounded ears or hanging down. We just say it's a dog, it's a cat, and we show hundreds of pictures. So it's similar like with children, you have these books, you know, with many pictures of cats and dogs and um, crabs, and you just show it and say this is a dog, yes, this is a cat, and so on. And if you do it many times with many different pictures, the children actually learn to recognize them. And so the process is very similar. We don't say how to distinguish, we just say what it is, and they build the connection themselves. Yeah, so how to get the results? Uh, the results are obtained from, from combination of different parts of the image. It might be from, from all the pixels. The pixels are randomly connected, and from the connection you get the results. Of course, if the connection is random, then the results will be quite poor or just random. But the network can teach itself from this, from this mistake and can improve the connections between the pixels in order to get the correct, uh, correct results. Yes, yeah, so for example, as here you can see, you can imagine that the different neurons here, and their connection is like combining different features, for example, ears with uh, nose, or paws, or eyes. And if the combining, for example, nose with ears gets a better result, that we are more likely to be correct than, for example, paws with uh, belly, so then the connection is strengthened, and the other is lowered, and that's how the process learns. It itself finds what are the important features and what combinations of important features actually lead to the result. Finally, we end up with a trained model. Uh, with such a model, we can process pictures of unknown animals. So if we, uh, if we input the, the dog picture into the model, it tells us that it's 100% probability of a dog, the similar with the cat. But if the unknown animal has some features which are uh, common to dogs and cats, we can get some, some mixture as this with 70% dog and 30% cat. So the neural network does not always give us a definite result, but it gives us a probability. If it is more likely a dog or more likely a cat. And that's important in science because often we do not have categorized information like black and white, this is this, this is that, but we have a smooth transition like shades of gray. So neural network, if we learn it even with the end members, with the black and white, it could potentially show us, if we show it a gray, that it's 30% uh, white and 70% uh, black. If the network is well trained and robust, that it builds the connections between the inputs and the results from, from many paths. And even if some features are not obvious from the picture, then we can get good results. And that's also good because sometimes we have incomplete data sets or we have very noisy data. So we don't always see all features of a cat. We sometimes see just a silhouette or, or a dog or we just see a face but not the tail. And Sometimes if we show something unknown to the network, like we just learn it with cats and dogs, but if we would show a tiger, maybe it would say that it's 60% cat and 40% dog, so maybe we can then derive that tiger is more related or relative to cat than a dog. So it can tell us even some unknown data if it is related to some other data or category. So this is a very good advantage of the neural network. So here is how we actually, with traditional methods, nowadays distinguish spectra of asteroids. So here you have table of different examples of asteroid spectra, invisible and near infrared. And you see that some of them have some absorption features. Some of them are quite flat, straight. Some of them are tilted down. Some of them are tilted up. But we don't know what is or we can guess the composition and we can guess some relation, but mainly this is done just by manually grouping them or using some statistical methods. So it's not objective. There is always some human uh, pre-assumptions involved. So we just at the beginning tried, if we use neural network, 
to just train it with some of these spectra, especially some of these end members where we know that they have deep absorption, so do not have them at all or have high slope. If the neural network can distinguish an unknown spectrum. So here is the result where basically here you correlate the actual class, spectral class, versus predicted by neural network. And you see that most of the results lie on the one-to-one -one line, so that means that the prediction was correct. Yeah, here, uh, as Thomas said, uh, the network gave us probability for all of these classes, and sometimes it happened that uh, we have multiple solutions, that is, the two probabilities are high and similar, for example, 49 and 51. It, it might be the case of the S and SR asteroids, which are very similar. So you can start to think about that these categories are actually very similar and there might be a smooth transition from one to another. Uh, as an example, there is a S and Q type asteroids, which are similar in composition. And the difference is that Q type asteroids have deeper absorption bands and S-type asteroids are more, more tilted. The changes of these two parameters are due to space weathering. Uh, that is, uh, let's say, how long the, the surface was exposed to space environment, for example, to, uh, to solar wind or micrometeorite bombardments. And there are also some, some intermediate uh, classes, as here, SQ, which is just between the S and, S and Q. So uh, evaluating the SQ asteroids, we can uh, get how far we are from Q and S if we train the model with Q and S. Yes, that's right, David. And uh, we know it from experiments with meteorites in laboratory. So if we cut a fresh meteorite, it has a spectrum similar to this Q-type asteroids. Like here you see green and blue. And if we irradiate the sample with like uh, protons or uh, with laser to simulate the exposure to the solar or space radiation or uh, impacts of dusty grains, it slowly actually turns into something what looks like S. So the absorption bands are weaker and the overall shape of the spectrum is, is getting more and, and more tilted. So basically, by measuring the ratio, if the neural network predicts it's 30% Q, 70% S, or vice versa, we can say how old is the surface, how long it was exposed to space, space environment. So first thing where we tested this method was on this asteroid Itokawa. It's about 500 to 200 meter elongated asteroid, and it was visited in 2005 by Japanese Hayabusa spacecraft, and it had also a spectrometer. So it measured a spectrum all around the asteroid, actually resolved to different points of the, of the surface. Yes, we took the spectra for, for all the points and uh, trained a network to tell us if it is more S or more Q-like. So what is the space weathering uh, index, let's say, of the surface. And we found that there are quite different areas on the surface. Yeah, so some are more fresh, like seen in the green colors, and some are more old or more weathered, as seen in the red colors. And if you then look at the, at the geology, some of them correspond to impact craters. So, for example, number two, number three, number eight, or number nine. So there was some impact, and it um, ejected the old material away and made a hole and exposed the fresh material. And uh, here we can see, for example, four and five. Those are topographic highs, so like a small mountains. And uh, the material tends to fall and move down to lower areas. So now, for example, 13 and 15 are old accumulation areas. So fresh material is exposed here, and that what is old on the surface gradually moves down, even on such a small asteroid, like, like downhill. So we have actually correlation with geology that this method works. We can predict what is older and what is younger, and we can correlate it with some geological features. Another thing we tried is to uh, derive specific Com mineral composition and abundances on surface of asteroids. So we 
train the network with spectra of uh, minerals and uh, laboratory mixtures and evaluate it, uh, spectra of meteorites and asteroids to get some uh, probability matrix and yeah, results. So, of course, you can do it with uh, traditional methods like uh, spectral modeling, but then you must manually model each spectrum. So you take some example of the end member spectrum like olivine or orthopyroxene and mix them together until it fits a spectrum of a meteorite and then you can derive, okay, I use maybe 30% olivine, 40% of pyroxene, but you must always do it manually. And one uh, problem is that these spectra do not really mix linearly. So it doesn't mean that if you have 30% of olivine and 40% and of uh, orthopyroxene, you just mix these in, in the same proportions and you will get the same result. It also depends that different areas of different brightness mix a bit differently. So it's a non-linear mixing process, but neural networks are very good in catching also non-linear problems. Yeah, and it actually works pretty well, uh, which is plotted in this graph. Uh, what is shown here are different mineralogical parameters which are in our model. On vertical line, uh, vertical axis, there is the error of our model, and on the horizontal, there is uh, how many points are within some error. And as you see, about 90% of points, regardless of the parameter, are within 15 percentage points uh, from the correct, uh, correct, re uh, correct result. And that is actually good, taking into account that we take full range of compositions from, for example, zero olivine up to 100% of olivine, zero orthopyroxene or clinopyroxene, 100. And also some variations in the composition. You can have olivines with more iron and less iron, and it change your spectral shape. So we have all this all these information here. And still, overall, we get 90% of values with reasonable error. So it works quite well. Here are some results for asteroids on a typical plot. Uh, in color we show uh, abundances of olivine and pyroxene for different types of asteroids. So for example, in this part uh, you can see that A-type asteroids are rich in uh, olivine, B-type asteroids are rich in pyroxene, and then there is a belt of Q and S type asteroids which are a mixture of olivine and pyroxene and there is a smooth trend uh, with decreasing olivine from Q to S. And that is again due to space weathering what we were talking uh, before and how it actually works. We know also from la laboratory that if you irradiate olivine it destroys the crystalline lattice faster than pyroxene. Olivine is res resistant to space weathering than pyroxene. Pyroxene tends to survive lo longer. And all these diagnostic spectral features are due to the crystalline lattice. If you destroy it, you still have there the minerale, but you turn it to glass, and it uh, does not have that pronounced spectrum or absorption bands anymore. So basically what you can see, this trend is not really a physical decrease of olivine content and increase of pyroxene, but it's just that you destroy olivine by space weathering faster than, than, uh, than pyroxene. Yeah, we tested this also on the surface of Itokawa, so you already s uh, saw this image. Uh, here, yeah. yeah, I'll put it back. Here, uh, what is blue is more fresh and what is red is more weathered. And on this image, there is the abundance of olivine, and again, more blue is more olivine, which is, which is uh, more fresh, and red is more weathered. And if I come back and forth, you can see that these uh, areas correlate very well. So there is a clear connection between uh, our olivine abundances, or our model olivine abundances, and space weathering. So basically we see that with the space weathering you also see relative changes in the detected olivine versus pyroxene amount due to the different resistivity of this mineral to space weathering. So one thing what we did is that the Hayabusa spacecraft, it actually picked up also some grains from the asteroid and bring them to Earth in a capsule. And then they were cut it and analyzed. So 
He, if you compare the analytical result, like percents of olivine or orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene, different minerals, with that, what we predicted for a mean value of asteroid Itokawa with our neural network, yes, you see, there is a bit less of olivine and a bit more of pyroxene. And that's due to a, a space weathering. So it basically works. It's just the olivine is more destroyed. That's why we see relatively less. Can we do something with that? Yeah, I'll just make one little note. If I come back, then on the less weathered areas where it, where it's more olivine, then the predicted olivine is about 75, which actually match very well uh, with the results of the laboratory analysis. But it might be interesting to try if for some specific type of asteroids, the, the ratio of olivine to pyroxene might be used to predict uh, or to estimate the space weathering age of the, of the surface, that is how long the surface is exposed to the to, uh, space environment, which might be a good proxy for, for age of the asteroid. So now we try to do a more detailed analysis, basically to check if by the ratio of olivine and pyroxene combined with some other data, we could also say how old is the surface, how long it was exposed. If this asteroid was is fresh and it, it originated by some collision, collision recently, or if it's old and it was not changed since many hundreds of millions or billions of years. So stay tuned. We are not just now working on that as a next step. And uh, also, actually, as was in the first lectures, introduced CubeSats. We are also working on a CubeSat, but not to Earth orbit but to asteroids, which will have hyperspectral camera. And all these tools which we now develop for the legacy data sets can be then applied on the new data to interpret the composition, trends of space weathering, or age of the surface. And we also think that in future, this one could be done already during the mission on board. So actually, the spacecraft, for example, to detect if there is some anomaly in the composition and take more detailed pictures and send us only these to save the data volume. So that's basically what we wanted to tell you and um, to show you how we can use neural networks to get some unbiased information, also with a low quality data, and uh, how we can get rid of some human assumptions and how we can process raw data, as one mentioned many times, without need of manual pre-processing. But remember one thing. Neural network can only tell you what is it trained for. If you train it with cats and dogs, and if you show it a pigeon, it will not tell you that it's pigeon. It will try to hard link it something and tell you it's 40% cat, 60% dog, but if you show another pigeon, it could tell you 80, 20. So it basically gives you some random results. So you must be careful if you go too far from the train data, then it does not work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, Thanks, uh, super interesting talk. I, I, I'm actually curious, it's the first time I see a talk on mineralogy of asteroids, and I'm curious, um, why is it interesting? Uh, could it in, uh, encode information of uh, how planets, for instance, were formed in our solar system based on the composition of asteroids? Well, of course, so there are basically two kinds of asteroids. One of them are called sort of, sort of primitive. So they are composed of the material of the very early solar nebula, as when it was cooling down, and from hot gas, solid particles started to crystallize. And it was not changed. The composition was not altered since then. And those are those Q and S when they are as weather what we were showing you. But then there are some which, like on our Earth, or it got too big that it got hot. It started to melt because it was too big. 
It also by gravity, heavier minerals or elements went to the core, the lighter went to the crust. That's why our crust is made of light elements like silica or aluminum or potassium, but core is made of iron and nickel. And uh, for example, this very pyroxenerich asteroids, this V-type, what we were showing, that belongs to asteroid Vesta, which underwent partial differentiation. So to understand composition of different asteroids, and if they are made of original set of minerals, or if there was some alteration, we call it differentiation, that helps us to understand, of course, how big planets evolved. So knowledge of mineralogy of asteroids is a key to understand the evolution of the whole solar system. Uh, yeah, thanks also for the talk on my behalf. Uh, I had a question. You showed the result of the actual measured um, um, sample from the asteroid, and it is below Nakamura et al. 2011. Is that is that where the the figures of the sample return analysis come from, or are they later? Yes, yes, yes. So the spacecraft visited the asteroid, I told, uh, 2005, if I recall correctly. And uh, the capsule landed on Earth a couple of years back uh, after. And then when they recovered some grains, there were some problems with the sampling, so they had only a few tiny grains. But it was enough to make an analysis. So those are all, all data. We just show it as a comparison for to match it with our data. And as that David pointed out, that. The most fresh areas on the asteroid, the blue ones, have values very similar to what was measured. Okay, and so to, to say why I ask, I ask is because it's important to know whether your predictions were made before or after you knew the sample return analysis results. It's, we I did mean, not use it, it for training. <laughs> I, know, I know that, but, but you know, Sometimes when we train the models, we, we, you know, we somehow like implicitly might want to prefer the model. Let's say we've got a bunch of models at hand, and we might prefer the model that we know to perform better in this validation checks. I'm not sort of saying that this is sort of foul play, but it's just a, a matter of importance to know whether the actual measurement was made after or before you published the, the predictions. No, no, no. This model was trained only with these uh, spectra, and those are from some catalogs. And then we evaluated the spectra of, uh, of Itokawa. So the validation was done with the raw minerals or their mixtures. We did not use any asteroid data only during the testing or validation. Only when we had ready network, then we ran it. I think Temu was referring to that you have to choose your hyperparameters for your model. That was, I think, what he was talking about. But uh, actually, when you said that the, the measures fit so well to your predicted data, if they are from the fresher areas, like it was 75% in the... So is it so that it, it is not known from where the samples were? Did, or, or, did, did they, or have they, like... Was it somehow lost from where the actual samples were taken from the asteroid? I think the samples are somewhere from the position between 2 and 14. Ah, OK. Yeah, I okay. think somewhere there. Somewhere there. Yes. But yeah. there is no, or it is assumed that the composition is roughly homogeneous on the whole surface, so it doesn't matter from which point which it is. Which is not correct. And these yeah. changes yeah. are mostly due to space weathering, not due to real changes in our living. Okay, any further so the, questions? The, just Go to ahead. add one sentence, the radiation damage due to space weathering is only first couple of hundred nanometers of the mineral grain. Yeah, and, uh, and it's enough to, because that's the optical path also of the light scattering. So when the sun shines, it interacts with the surface, reflects back. But if you cut the grain, you always expose. If you have millimeter grain, you don't look this. 200, 300 nanometer rim, or you look it, but you do the analysis from the center. The center of the mineral grain is already fresh, but ah, it's yes. unaffected by space weathering. Yes, but yes. the spectral information comes only from first couple of hundred yeah, nanometers. So it's not the really the real surface dust that is. 
some. That's why yeah. if you would yeah. take even a grain from the very desert area, the red one, and cut it and get an analysis from the center, you will still get the fresh value. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, there is quite a lot of actually use of AI for different kinds of astronomy kind of applications. I can uh, tell that I had uh, uh, last spring a bachelor student who was doing a bachelor thesis about the use of AI for detection of, of uh, exoplanets. So there is lots of observational data and, and, and really a lot and only a tiny fraction of that is like exoplanet uh, uh, detections. So very interesting work in, 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 in space applying AI. So thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. And we go to, to the last set of speakers for today. They will talk about a topic uh, with, I would say, keywords, namely space, supercomputers, and AI. And you have seen in the program that it says that it's Temo Roos and, 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 and uh, 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 what does it say in the program? Temo Roos and Minna Palm wrote it says. The problem is just that Minna has uh, fallen ill, so uh, she will not be here. So instead of, of uh, Minna, we will have here Lucille Truck from Minna's group. She's an academic research fellow, and now we are not in the previous departments, we are now in the Department of Physics at the University of Helsinki. She uh, works on the interaction between uh, the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field, and uh, is part of a group developing and using something called the Vlasiator model. I don't know, maybe we hear about it soon. Uh, a massively parallel simulation of, of Earth's magnetic environment, and this group is led by, by Minna Palamrot. The other speaker we will have is Professor Temo Roos from the Department of Computer Science. His uh, uh, topic in computer science is AI. He's leading the AI education program at the Finnish Center for Artificial Intelligence and is the, the man behind the immensely popular massive online course called Elements of AI, having more than one million people sign up for it. It also has a continuation course called Building AI. Anyways, uh, this will now be handled so that first we will hear from Lucille, and then we will hear from, from Teemo. So please, Lucille, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you hear me clearly in the room if I hold the mic like this? Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I have the honor of replacing Minna Parmot this afternoon. The slides are hers, so I'm just doing the talking. She kindly provided the slide for the presentation. So I'll start by saying that space is nowadays a mega trend. We've seen that in all the presentations before. Space is everywhere in your GPS, in getting the 4G network and all that. And um, the, this uh, graph here shows clearly how things have changed into space. In the past decade, the number of satellites has increased astronomically, pun intended. The graph starts from the very first uh, human-made object that was put in orbit, the Sputnik satellite, in 1957. And then you can see the number of satellites stayed roughly constant for the decades that the Cold War lasted, with the majority of satellites being actually defense satellites. And then in the past 10 years, things have changed. And you see the number of satellites increasing dramatically and changing to actually having commercial satellites into space. And uh, this is because space has become a lot more accessible with the launches becoming relatively more affordable and allowing more and more spacecraft to be launched. Um, we even got like these huge peaks from the last year that correspond to the advent of those super constellations like Starlink. One thing that changed at the same time as this increasing number is also the size of satellites that were put into space. Before we had this um, huge satellites that took years of development, now we have smaller and smaller satellites. 
And uh, we've heard that those CubeSats are great. They can be developed easily and rapidly. However, these satellites also tend to be more vulnerable to the space environment. And that poses questions related to their longevity in space. Because space is not just empty, it is actually a very harsh environment. And we call that the space weather. So just like the atmospheric weather can some days be sunny, like today it's really nice, but tomorrow might be rainy, we might even get a storm, the conditions in space, the space weather can also get stormy or more quiet. And that all depends from the activity at the sun. So the, the, the sun every so often releases giant clouds of solar particles and electromagnetic field into space that we call solar storms. And as these uh, solar storms arrive at Earth, they can create uh, actually quite a long list of adverse effects for our technologies in space, on the ground, and also on human health. Fortunately, down here on Earth, we don't have to worry about the human health aspects. It's mostly for astronauts that it can be a problem. When energetic particles arrive with the solar storms, this creates uh, high levels of radiation that can endanger astronauts if they're outside the space stations at that time on the spacewalk. And we're starting to talk about missions to the moon or to Mars when people will be out there in space, in their small spaceship. Um, and solar storm might come. So this kind of effects can become more important. In terms of spacecraft, the same energetic particles can also be a problem in damaging or even completely destroying spacecraft electronics. Another adverse space weather as effect that we have is the heating and the expansion of the upper part of the atmosphere. You might have heard uh, at the beginning of last year, there was a launch of uh, several tenths of Starlink satellites that happened at the same time as a relatively minor or moderate solar storm. But because the satellites were in such low Earth orbit and the, atm the upper atmosphere expanded, the increased drag, drag caused the satellites to fall back into the atmosphere and be lost just after their launch. Now, down here on Earth, it sounds like quite distant effects, but the most intense of those solar storms can also have an impact that uh, can be felt on Earth. The largest event that happened since the beginning of the space era took place in 1989 and caused large-scale power disruptions in North America, in particular in the province of Quebec. Some parts of the province were out without electricity for nine hours because the transformers had been damaged by the solar storm. So with all that, um, it is uh, extremely important to be able to understand and forecast space weather in order to mitigate its effects. And how can we do that? Well, we need basically the same tools as meteorologists. We need observation points like scientific satellites in orbit around Earth, ground-based measurements that will tell us what's going on out there. And we also need very detailed modeling tools to reproduce what's happening in the system. However, such modeling comes with challenges. Um, and so here you have a picture that actually comes uh, from, uh, from a simulation model. The Earth is at the center in the, in, the, in the dark circle. And you can see this huge region of space all around it. And that's where the fun physics is going on, or the important space weather conditions are determined. The sun is to the right. Uh, so you're right, coming from here with the solar wind. Um, which is the constant stream of particle coming from the sun. And on top of the solar wind, that's when we get solar storms uh, from time to time. And we are mostly protected from the solar wind thanks to the Earth magnetic field. The Earth has a magnetic field, which makes your, magnet point, your compass point north, uh, but also expands into space far around our planet and creates a kind of magnetic bubble or magnetic shield that um, protects us from the solar wind and stretches out far on the other side of Earth. That's the huge like, blue color you see. That's our magnetic bubble. And, um, 
And so we, we need to be able to understand the processes going on in this uh, area of space. However, this is huge. We're talking about one million kilometer in the direction uh, along the Sun-Earth line. And we also need to include what's going on in the transverse direction with several hundreds of thousands of kilometers. And again, sorry, how do I get back this? And then the third one isn't shown because it's out of the plane of the picture. So we have this giant volume of space, which astronomers might actually think that's tiny. But the challenge here is that not only is that big, we need also to understand what's going on at very small scales at the same time, at scales of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers. And that's all the ripples and vortices that you see on the pictures, on the picture here. Those are all interesting physical processes that determine this uh, interaction between solar wind and Earth magnetic field and what will eventually become the adverse space weather effects. So how can we model this huge system with so many scales being involved? Well, scientists have developed a number of modeling techniques to do that. Each of them have their advantages and have their drawbacks, so they're used for different purposes. To the left, you have an example of uh, a so-called fluid or magnetohydrodynamic model. So in that case, we consider that the ions and electrons in the system are a fluid, so they behave collectively. That has the advantage of being relatively numerically light, so this kind of simulations can be run in real time. And those are the kind of simulations that are currently used for space weather forecasting. The drawback is that you lose the small scale physics and a lot of details, but you get an accurate description of what's going on on large scale. Now on the picture, you see um, a simulation of near Earth space, but uh, these kind of simulations are also used to encompass the entire solar system and see where solar storms are heading once they erupt from the sun. Do they go towards Mars or Jupiter or another planet? In the center, you have another example of an approach that is now called a hybrid particle in cell. So hybrid means that we are interested in the physics of the ions, and this time we track the motion of particles, the motion of ions in the system, but electrons are still a fluid that just follow what the ions are doing. So we now get a lot more detailed physics, and you can see that there's a lot more to see on the picture than on the one to the left. But that comes at the cost of the computing time. It now takes weeks to get a few minutes of real physical time simulated by the model. And the third one, the third model to the right is actually the uh, Vlasieto model that was briefly mentioned in my introduction. That is um, the, the model we develop in our group at the University of Helsinki, led by Minna Palmot. And this model uses yet another approach. It's still a hybrid model, so electrons are a fluid, but ions are this time treated as velocity distribution functions. So instead of dealing with individual particles, we, uh, we work with, um, with an object in velocity space that tells us basically where all the particles are going and how fast. And we get, um, because of this description, we get uh, a lot less noise than in the central picture, so we see a lot more of the details in the physics. But again, the computing costs becomes higher, and it now takes up to months to get our minutes of, of, sim of simulation, sorry, of physical time in the simulation. So with this, uh, with this simulation, we are able to understand with great accuracy what are the physical processes that happen in the Earth space. You see in the animation here a lot of things going on behind Earth, and the model is really instrumental in making breakthroughs in the physics that, that's going on there. Um, However, we are not able to use this model for space weather forecasting just because it's so slow to run, but understanding how the physics works is also crucial to refine uh, how space weather is forecast. This, the development of this model also goes hand in hand with high performance computing. We are 
Um, we are currently running the code. Ah, that's the sentence that was missing because stuff was in. <laughs> the, the font appeared in, in black instead of white. So there's one missing sentence that says that we are using the world's largest supercomputers. And in particular, we have at the moment uh, a run on the Lumi supercomputer at CSC. And the Vlasieto model is also one of the flagship codes in the European Center of Excellence in Code Development uh, that aims at uh, preparing uh, numerical models for the next generation of supercomputers for exascale. And with this, I will pass on the floor to my colleague who will tell us about how to use AI to uh, get information from the simulation. Do you want this? Thank you, Lucille. Um, I, I apparently didn't get the memo of having all the backgrounds black for the space theme, so I've got white slides here. Apologies for that. Uh, my name is Temurus. I uh, work with uh, Minna Palmroot's team on a joint project called DAISY. That's actually a reference going back to Patrick's initial words about uh, Space Odyssey, if you remember the part where Hal is being taken apart, it starts singing this song about Daisy. That's, uh, that's a reference to, to that bit, so that's kind of a wink uh, at that direction. Uh, but anyways, uh, a joint project by the Research Council of Finland, so that's in academy, um, that's, so I'm an academia in Finnish, uh, that we have with, with Mina's team. Um, and I'll be talking about the last, uh, last hype word here, namely AI, what we, what we do there. Uh, but just to give, um, you know, give meaning to the, to the things that we're doing, um, I'm showing here a cl video clip, actually by NASA, uh, showing some things going on um, in, in this case in the, in the sun or the, near the, the surface of the, or the corona of the sun. Uh, where the important bit is going to be the reconnection of the field lines here. So I'll, I'll let you watch that a bit. Kind of a bubble breaking, breaking off. So those are magnetic field lines. Um, okay. So, the, so that, that's kind of the focus of the collaboration with Mina's team um, and my team at the, at the CS department. Um, and that's called magnetic reconnection. So that's the, that's the focus of the project. Uh, and, and that phenomenon basically means that the, the field lines that are, you know, that are familiar from probably school where you were looking at magnets and the, you know, the poles of the magnet are connected by these lines that you can actually, sh can actually see if you put some like iron chips on you know, on a plate and then you put a magnet under it then the field lines will be formed. So that's the same thing. And then uh, in the, uh, when the, let's say the, the solar wind is creating that, that all that turbulence around the sun's magnetic uh, field, you get, you, you sometimes get reconfiguration of the field lines in a way of those, let's say those bubbles forming. And they kind of form like little magnetic islands, they're called. Um, and that, tends to be, uh, I'm told by the physicists, and you know, there are physicists who know all about it here, so I hope I'm not making a uh, complete fool of, out of myself, but, but uh, I've been told that they, they are very important phenomena in terms of uh, how magnetic energy is being sort of uh, converted into kinetic energy, and then you know, plasma, plasma gets accelerated, and uh, that's, that's part of the, 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 the process by which northern lights, or aurora, are, for instance, created. So you can actually see by the by the bare eye that this phenomenon causes some 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 things uh, in the sky, um, and that's also related, uh, incidentally, in on on some issues with uh, plasma containment in fusion reactors, so tokamaks. So uh, so we're hoping to also solve fusion energy uh, as a byproduct of this little project. Would be nice. Um, so, uh, so the so the where we're going with uh, with that and trying to understand it better uh, has to do with very sort of fundamental issues with uh, vector field topology. Um, I will not go into 
all, all the details here, uh, but, uh, but the idea is that you can look at the magnetic field which we get from the, from the Blasiator simulator, which is great. Um, and then we try to summarize its topology, and that revolves around the, the null points where the magnetic field is zero. Um, and, uh, and trying to sort of uh, approximate the field around those zero points. So they're kind of fundamental in describing the topology of the field. Uh, and then we, uh, we can classify those points in different types based on, uh, well, basically the, the eigenvalues of the, of the Jacobian if you're, if you're into vector field topology. Um, and then uh, when we've done that, we can even start connecting them. So on the left, you can see this, uh, this, this picture that is um, a, a snapshot of, of the topology uh, characterized by the, the, there's these dots, which are the nulls. So the magnetic field is zero there. So, you know, the magnetic field doesn't pull um, an, an ion anywhere at that point. Uh, and they're connected by these lines that we have extracted from the, from the field and, and they're supposed to represent the, the kind of the um, connectivity of those points uh, in a way that characterizes the topology. So if the topology remains the same, then the graph shouldn't change, but if the topology changes, then the graph should change, change as well. Um, and then, then we look at the dynamics of those graphs, so we you know, speak of something, um, or we speak of the so-called temporal null graph uh, from which you can identify changes. So, so on the right, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to see from here, but if, if I try to, does this, wait. Oh, okay. Mm, here, uh, you would see a new null point emerging in, in, the, in, the, in the field, and that's a sign of, of some change uh, in the topology of the, of the magnetic field. In, so time goes sort of to the right in that chart. Okay. Um, so the and and that, and the part where we're starting to now come with some sort of uh, machine learning applications and sort of bringing some of our expertise to the project is that uh, we take these type of graphs. Uh, so we kind of condense or, or, or um, extract the, the rep so the data so from the data, the rich data that the Blasiator uh, produces. We extract these topological representations, and we're trying to use them uh, as the input to our machine learning algorithms. Um, and those familiar with uh, with the latest uh, neural network um, research are familiar with graph neural networks, which are a type of neural networks that are uh, particularly well suited to uh, modeling graph data, so you can can kind of put the graph there into the network and and then use the use it to classify or let's say forecast what would happen next in the simulation um, or in the plasma field, like uh, you know assuming that the simulator represents the the reality um, and the and the applications we're going towards uh, so this is kind of where we're at now, so the next steps in the project are to try to use this type of representations and this type of machine learning models uh, to identify some important events in the simulation so that because the simulation is so com complex and there's like immense amounts of data coming out of it, uh, it, it is really crucial that you try to identify which aspects of the simulation are worth taking a closer look at. Um, you can't just like look at all the data coming out of the simulation. It, like you can't even save all the data or store all the data coming out of the simulation. So you'd be able, you'd, you'd have to somehow be able to find what is like of importance in the simulator uh, output. And, and that's one, one of the purposes of, of, of this type of machine learning uh, modeling. Um, and then the, 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 no, the idea and the phenomenon of the reconnection is still poorly understood, especially like if you think of it in the full 3D um, um, dimension and not only in 2D where it's better understood. Uh, so we're sort of going towards that, uh, that as well, trying to sort of really see uh, what, what, what are the topological changes that tend to take place um, in the field. Um, and and also trying to sort of think if we could then use that to forecast what, what is happening there. And that, that might actually be also useful in sort of feeding back to the simulator and maybe 
refining the, the simulation at, at, at those points where something interesting is just about to happen in the simulator. So uh, kind of speeding up the simulation uh, when nothing of importance is going to happen, but then like slowing it down and increasing the resolution when, when there's an event of importance uh, about to happen. Um, yeah, that's, that's all um, uh, that I had sort of prepared, so I'm, I'm sure I and Lucille hopefully can answer your questions then, if, if you have any. Thanks. So, any questions? No questions? There, we have one, okay. We're also running out of time, so we don't have time for many questions. So, so maybe good that there is not ten hands up at the same time. So, do you actually apply the neural network during the simulation as it is ongoing in, on some partial results to predict what will most likely happen and where something interesting will happen? Uh, that, currently, not yet. So, we're currently just like taking batch data or like simulated sim simulation sequences from Glaciator and then analyzing them. But that's one of the ideas that we could actually run it real time alongside the simulation uh, in order to sort of feed back into the simulator to do this like adaptive mesh refinement. So that, that would be one goal of, in future research. Thank you. Any other question? If not, then we thank uh, Lucille and... Uh, I just Temo. wanted to ask, uh, Lucille, what, what's the weather going to be uh, in ah. Johannes next year? Do you, do, can you answer that? The space weather. So, well, the easy answer I could get, but it's actually space climate if you're asking me for next year. So that's a different field, and I refer you to another colleague. Uh, but so I would... climate change, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> space climate change. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I would say that space weather forecasting is still worse than um, uh, weather forecasting is, and we've seen that the FMI has been pretty bad with all the rain, like predicting all the rain this summer. Uh, so I wouldn't make any prediction. So I think we could get anything between snow and sun for next year, Hannus. So. Thanks for that. In the program, it says closing discussion. So we have still the opportunity to ask any of our speakers something if you just came to think about it now and not directly after the speech. I see no reactions in the public here. So thanks to all the. No, there is one. Ah. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Ian. Um, I had a question. Uh, will you talk to us about uh, CubeSats? Uh, but I, I also wonder about like other instruments that are out of Earth orbit. So we have instruments, different instruments in solar orbit. Um, what would you say is the future of like? downlinking slash uplinking to instruments outside of Earth orbit. Can you repeat the second part of your question about the instruments? I'm sure I was walking here. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so my question is, um, what is uh, your take on the future of downlinking slash uplinking of instruments that are outside of Earth orbit? Outside of what orbit? Outside of Earth orbit, so Earth other orbit, things. There are other there. things than the than so, the cubes, cubes it, That's the, the point. So, do not have any instruments basically in solar orbit or? Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, like oh, so, instruments in solar orbit, for instance, like. Okay. So, if you go to solar orbits, you go like the interplanetary internet connections and the. Uh, the CubeSats technology is not for the uh, interplanetary internet things, even not for the Mars or Moon cases. The target of the uh, CubeSats are, you know, lower than low orb Earth orbit satellites, 
and mostly are used for the earth applications. We have all these Internet of Things in the world now, uh, millions and billions, so we will try to create similar space segment for the applications that the ground IoT devices cannot handle. And I had also slides, I wish I had more time. There are many, many use cases that indeed the ground IoTs fail or they cannot capture them. And, and also uh, uh, low earth orbit satellites cannot capture them because they are 800 to 1,000 miles outside. So it's kind of like drones are also not helping too much because their coverage areas are, are short. That's why we are going somewhere in the middle so that we can cover more and uh, expand the IoT applications. That's the, and I recommend you to read the papers that I put there or contact me and I can give you some uh, pointers, okay? Good question. But it's far away from the like Mars missions or interplanetary internet, long way to go. And, and I am will be available uh, at the department tomorrow, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and anyways, thanks for this. Uh, uh, so we heard today talks about uh, uh, like exploring things in space using computing. We heard about uh, things on the Earth where we have satellites helping how we do things on Earth. We heard about uh, uh, venturing into space. Uh, everywhere computing is essential. So I hope you had uh, an interesting evening with us and have things to think about when you go home. Uh, keep, keep an eye on what's going on in Tiedekulma. There are lots of interesting events going on here. So with these words, I thank all the speakers and the audience for attending this event about computing and space. Thank you.